this call is being put on by Climate Farmers, which is a new organization helping to scale regenerative agriculture in Europe by building the infrastructure to make that possible and empower farmers where they are. And uh, yeah, today we're going to be exploring the very wide and fast developing world of arable farming and its potential for regenerating farmland. Um, we've got written descriptions of everybody, but I'd actually like to hand it over to each of you to give your own introductions. I think it'll be a little bit more dynamic that way. Starting with Ademir, can you tell us where you're calling in from and how you came into this line of work? Just to introduce myself, is that right? Sure. So I am Caligari from Brazil. I'm a soil researcher. I was born in the, in the farm, in a small farm here. I'm living in the South Brazil. I work in the working in the Research Agriculture Institute here in Paraná State, one of the most uh, developed uh, area with the annual crops. We are responsible for 20 percent, more or less, the old 27 state in Brazil, and we started here. Mr. Herbert Bart started in 1972 here in South America with the no-till, and we are working in the system during many years. Many farmers. So now I'm a consultant during the last 10 years with the farmers working with the small, medium, large scale farmers. I said largely in the center of Brazil or the Cerrado Savannah area that has 5, 10, 20,000 hectares. And here in the south, I'm here now, we have farmers with the 200, 300, 400 hectares, 500, some little bit more in work with annual crops or soybean main, mainly. So I've been maize, rotate with the wheat, some barley, and use cover crops and integrate with the, the also the, the, the animal production, the beef production. So in this you are doing more or less. Fantastic. All right, I'll hand it over to Ray. Could you give us a little introduction into your own line of work and how you got started here? Oh, thank you, Oliver. I'm a retired ex-government employee. Don't hold it against me. I worked for the USDA, uh, NRCS. I worked as a, an agronomist, a soil scientist, district conservationist, water quality project manager. Worked in four states. I'm also a rancher. I, I raise sheep, and I have two or three cows just to get a little respectability because, you know, over here, if you say you raise sheep, people laugh at you. Uh, I'm also a co-founder of Soil Health Academy and understanding ag. Uh, and so if you have any problems with anything I say, just dial 1-800-8-GABE-BROWN, Gabe Brown, and let him know. Was... That's a good disclaimer there. Make sure you direct those complaints that direction. Ben Taylor Davies, could you give us a little introduction to your work and how you got started? Yeah, hi. Um, so yeah, I'm Ben. Um, I farm and advise in the UK. Um, not really sure how I stumbled into regenerative agriculture, really. It's, it's one of those things that it's a bit like a snowball, I guess. You, you start off one day with a concept or an idea and you just think, um, well, you know, what if I did this and it was slightly different? And then uh, that often leads to the very next thing that, um, uh, and before you know it, you, you, you've sort of hit full regen. Um, and, and I certainly practice what I preach. I've got a, um, a farm of about 550 acres or 230 hectares. Uh, where we practice everything from cover cropping to trying to grow regenerative potatoes to managing a flood, which we uh, consists of some alpacas and goats and sheep and cattle. And uh, we've been introducing pigs into that flood now as well. Um, mob grazing principles of herbal lays, uh, trying to build our soils as much as we can because um, we happen to live in a highly polluted river basin, um, which is full of phosphate. And, and, and just trying to do my little bit for, for I guess, uh, linking the fact that we can do food production and do food production well, but we can do it in such a way that the environment is actually enhanced. I don't think they, they should be mutually exclusive and 99% and, and of what I talk about and what I do and what I advise and what I try and show and demonstrate is that the more I do for the environment, the more profit I seem to make. Um, and, and they go hand in hand. Um, and I think that's really important that actually uh, once you flip it on its head, uh, it, it works and it's so much more fun. 
I, I, I keep saying I put the fun back into farming every time I wake up and every time I come up with a crazy new idea and go and put it into practice, it's absolutely great fun to watch it watch it unfold and work. And yeah, so for me, um, putting the fun back into farming is is something I think, um, you know, we, we should do. Man, what a great message to start us out there with. And before we get into the first question, I just want to remind all of the participants to please keep your microphones muted so that there isn't any background noise that interrupts the speakers. And that we'll be taking questions and there will be a very live and active chat as usual in the chat function on Zoom. And please hold your questions to the last half hour. We will make plenty of time for you to ask your questions directly to our speakers here. Uh, so just hold on those to the last half hour. So with that out of the way, Let's start this off with a bit of an ambitious question, which is what are the most important things to be aware of when managing farm ecologies that are dependent on grass and legume species for their income? Because that can be a bit of a limiting factor when your crops are dependent on annual cycles, especially when it comes to soil building. Uh, let's start with Adam Ayer for the first response there. Uh, I think that in, in, in our conditions here, uh, mainly we have uh, some areas of farmers that uh, they develop cattle production and also they need uh, some pasture. What you have here in all Brazil is a huge area with some degraded, degraded pasture. You know, the estimated more in Brazil, the whole country around 220 million hectares in the pasture. We estimate now maybe more than 50% or almost 60% with degraded. So I think that this is an important point to take into account. I think there is one word that I learned during my life with many other uh, scientists, specialists, farmers as well. We also have the honor to be the Marie Bartz that accompany us here from Portugal. He's the Herbert Bartz daughter. So he's very involved in all the STEM, in the no-till, all these specialists in, in microorganisms. So the, the point is the uh, the diagnosis or your diagnostic. This is very important. What is the limitation that you have in the system? For us, for example, we have a strong limitation in our condition that you dis discover is not a problem with the soil compaction in this condition of the, 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 the pasture area, mainly with the grass. Some legumes as well, some stylosanthes, some other species, the legume that we are using, but this you are talking about this perennial uh, grass species, brachiaria and, and, and other other species. The problem is not compaction, not just lack of uh, calcium, but the main problem for our this condition is nematodes. And th this point is very important for us that we discovered that, for example, the old grass that you have, the brachiaria and other species of, they are not tolerant with the, the fratilangus brachiaurus. It's a strong challenge for not only these pasture areas, but also some legume species and grasses. So we needed to to make something with that. We need to make some rotate. We need to, to increase the, 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 the natural enemies. We need to look for improve more soil organic matter is a great problem for us in our tropical and subtropical conditions is one limitation. Uh, and also is when you put integrate with some area with the grain production and as well with the, the grasses or the, 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 the cattle uh, production, integrate livestock in, in agriculture. When you make this balancing and put more a condition to increase the microbiota in order to capture the, the, the surrogate carbon, uh, this is a point that we, we start to increase the natural enemies. We have also now the, the, the approach with the use of biological products. We have a lot of here is increasing quite a lot in these two, three years with the biological nematicide and also some, of the, some root disease in, uh, uh, biological approach products like uh, trichoderma, like uh, poconia, like uh, others. So the point, the main point is to see how, how is the limitating the process. For example, here in, for a long time, uh, many lives, many discussions, many people said, oh, in Brazil, uh, we have around 40 million hectares with soybean. Oh, the problem with, with in areas with soybean that rotate with maize on another crops in some area of rotate with grass and legume, this is the problem is not more chemical. We achieve the equilibrium with the chemical attributes, but this is not true. We are discovering now a lot of problems because we have a lot of problem of the aluminum content. We have a lot of soil acidity and this aluminum is 
is goes up, we have a strong problem with the 10, 20 centimeters, 40 centimeters of the, the avoided the, the root growth. So this is limited the system. Also for the system of the grass for cattle uh, production as well for agriculture. So the lime, the gypsum is increasing a lot of the use when properly adequate with the, the, the methodology, the use, we are starting to change this to promote more uh, oxygenation in the, the, in the roots. So uh, create more condition for more microorganisms, also put calcium into the, the soil profile is very important uh, for increase the microbiota. And also the use of the, the, the uh, like bradyrhizobium and other microorganisms that you put this main in soybean, like Azospirinum brasiliense. This is a, a wonderful here in Brazil, like a revolution of the research many years here. And also the, this uh, Azospirinum are in different species in the world. We increase the nitrogen fixation by the grasses. You can increase 14, 16% of the dry mass of these grasses. You can increase 20, 24, 25% of the protein content of this. So more nitrogen in the system. When you mix these grasses also, for example, cowpea and, and brachiaria, they have strong results. You increase more nitrogen, increase more protein, it's good for the cattle, you're good for the soil, you increase the soybean production, and mainly you are increasing the soil organic matter because more microorganisms, nitrogen like a, a, a combustible, like a gasoline for the improve this, and you have more condition to, to increase the, the, the carbon sequestration. So the most important point is to see where you are, the, the rainfall is there are some uh, um, limited something, some constraint, biological, chemical, and physical approach. And this to see what you need to do there. So there is no prescription ready. You need to do this very important diagnosis and put some cover crops that can also uh, improve mycorrhiza, it's a hostage of mycorrhiza, bring nitrogen, uh, cycling sulfur, cycling phosphorus, and other things to look for the equilibrium that you wish for that uh, special plot, a special system. Wow, those are incredible observations. I love that focus on the chemistry in the soil. Ray, can you tell us from your opinion and your experience, some of the most important things to consider in these types of uh, annual cropping systems? Thank you, Ademir. We've seen the same problems, but I think the biggest problem we have in the United States is the compaction between the years. Uh, we have compaction between the years. It's the way people look at the soil ecosystem. It's through the whole planet dealing with humans. Most of the humans think the soil is just a growing medium. It's a living dynamic ecosystem. And that's a challenge until farmers understand it's a living dynamic ecosystem. You're not gonna change the way you do management. The other, to add to that, case in point, we in this country are putting way too much nitrogen, too much legumes in the natural, in these cropping systems, like for example, soybean and alfalfa. This is why the ground gets very hard. People don't understand what people say, well, you're removing carbon. No, you have legumes giving nitrogenous compounds, very poor roots, they leak, and soils are gonna balance their diet. So they're gonna eat aggregates and the soil is gonna get compacted. We have too much manure, too much fertilizer, too much chemicals, mismanagement, not enough carbon flow. Most people don't understand that our native prairie ecosystems only had 10% legumes in natural ecosystems. We have millions of acres of soybeans, then we wonder why we have so many water quality problems. Soils do not stop balancing. They do not stop eating. Those microbes, if they see free nitrogen in the system, they're gonna eat aggregates, they're gonna eat carbon and they're gonna diminish the pore space. So you have this vicious cycle going on in our country. So what have we done? We now have a new soil test by Dr. Rick Haney from retired AU ARS USDA. We now can measure organic nitrogen in the soil ecosystem. We can measure that form. We have never been able to measure and if some of you have heard Dr. White talk, Dr. White from Rutgers, we know now that plants are carnivores. They can actually suck up bacteria and strip their outer shells and use them as a food source. Yes, those were vegans, you are eating carnivores. So here's the thing, we're finding out with new science that we're way off. 
we're just beginning, like Ademir talked about. We know grasses now that fix that fix help fix nitrogen. So we're just beginning, but here's the thing. In this country, way, way too much use of legumes, nitrogen, manure. Oh, we're killing ourselves with our own tools. Too much tillage, too much fertilizer, too much chemicals, poor rotations. That's where it is. Why? Again, the lack of understanding, and they don't understand that the goal is to mimic and emulate nature and its architecture. And Amir taught us that. So we're very helpful. That was, we're very uh, appreciative of that. Yeah, what a great way to look at that as an entire ecosystem rather than being sort of a dead and undynamic element in the farm ecology. Ben, how does that square with your own observations and what do you think are the most important considerations in these systems? I think for me, the most important consideration is the fact that we, we, we're dealing with a biological vacuum. Um, uh, whether it's uh, huge areas of soybean, winter wheat, you name it, um, any, any monocrop above ground will create um, a vacuum to allow what we consider pests, weeds and diseases in. Uh, exactly the same then happens underground. Uh, we're selecting for, uh, by overuse of tillage, overuse of chemicals, overuse of chemical fertilizers. Um, and the controls that we're trying to make to control certain what we consider our pests are often the very pests that come straight back into the vacuum that we've created in the first place. And funny enough, we end up with a, with a, 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 a total vicious circle that gets worse and worse and worse. So what we're trying to do over in the UK an awful lot is, 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 is what we term a biological flood. Where what we're looking for is the word, and it hasn't been mentioned yet today, is, is diversity. Uh, and that's diversity in everything and anything we're trying to achieve. Um, so the, the, the use of compost extracts full of uh, everything we're looking for in the soil is used whenever we can uh, apply that. We, we're trying to cram out to the point, not just through a predation, but working on the principle where if my soil is absolutely filled with biology, the chances of something, whether it be fusarium, whether it be a nematode, whether it be anything becoming dominant in something that is essentially full, is, is more, more, than, more the case never going to happen. And that, that, that happens underground and above ground. And we're, we're doing this uh, through many different ways, the companion cropping, catch cropping, cover cropping, even, even starting to plant, um, you know, and, and, and uh, Jason Mag in, in, in America growing relay crops, we're growing things like boats where we're actually mixing beans and oats. Um, to, to, to add that diversity, to, to try and um, above and below ground. We're seeing some phenomenal yield responses. We're seeing some phenomenal disease, natural disease and, and pest control by, by mixing crops, by mixing varieties, by, by using populations as well, rather than actually sticking to one variety of a monoculture across a thousand, thousand hectares of billions and billions of uh, essentially clones. So, so for me, um, diversity, biology, um, more diversity and more biology seems to be, uh, for me, one of the main answers in, in, in trying to actually overcome some of this. And, and for those that have got a pulse, cereal or grass rotation, you've just got to work that much harder in between. Yeah, definitely. And I want to kind of give a little overview here because a lot of the issues that people have as they transition to regenerative systems of annual crops are often managed as individual problems and missing the idea that this is a connected ecosystem where if you address a single thing, you can often have roll-on solutions. Things like managing weed pressure in no-till systems or managing pests across monoculture plantings of a large scale. Uh, and the gradual process that it takes to transition a damaged farm ecosystem into one that is resilient against a lot of different things that can happen increasingly as climate change is starting to, you know, really hit these ecologies that are vulnerable quite hard. Uh, maybe back to Ben, uh, tell me how you start to manage these things, not as individual problems, but as an entire ecology, and where do you tend to look first or <coughs> advise on intervening? I think, um, um, looking at the, um, <laughs> The chat, I believe I need to slow down a bit. I think my accent is probably um, slightly um, 
causing some issues for translation. I am from the southwest of the UK and um, rather broad accent. So I will try and slow down a little bit and, um, and, and come back to this sort of thing. But I think Ray, Ray hit the nail on the head, you know, look to nature. I spend my life um, and an awful lot of my life at that, just, just staring at, at, at hedgerows, at, at, um, at, at what nature does and how nature um, does this sort of thing. Whether we call it biomimicry, what, whether we call it following the natural ecosystem, it, it's, it's quite amazing that when you start to look at nature and think, well, that's how, um, and, and uh, a chap called Adam Driver in the UK said um, something quite, quite poignant. If it feels right, it generally is right. And I do think that the whole gut feeling of, um, of agronomy, of plant physiology, of things like that sort of thing, is as much of a gut feeling. And while I appreciate all the science that needs to come and, and back it up, there's an awful lot of feeling that the right thing is often is definitely the right thing and gets proven time and time again. So for me, um, it's, it's, it's copying what Ray said. It, you, you stand, you look, you observe. How can I implement this into my cropping system? Uh, whether that's introduction of animals, whether that's introduction of diversity, uh, whether it's any introduction of anything, I think you'll, you'll find nature, nature speaks volumes if you actually sit and just, just spend a couple of minutes watching. Um, and, um, and for me, um, you, I, I don't come across it that often, but you know, it won't work here, that, that sort of attitude. Um, I, I look at the world and think, well, most of the world's covered in soil and covered in plants. Um, so in actual fact, you, you know, we, we, are so, we are so joined up. Um, it doesn't matter. Um, there, there's obviously a few places in, in, in the world that isn't, but, you know, we're all joined by that, that very thing. Mother Nature tries to protect, us, protect her soil um, by covering it with green material. And as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's a very good starting point. Very well said. And you can see from the chat that there's quite a lot of agreement as well. Uh, Ray, what would you like to add to that? And where do you see the, the potent intervention or change of mindset points with a lot of the people that you work with? Uh, ben, if Ben was to, uh, did a, uh, if Ben would do a quiz, it'd be, we'd do biology and diversity, right, Ben? That would be it. Because Ben's right. But here's the thing that I always think about. Some of us, we study stuff like the butterfly effect. The initial condition of any ecosystem is critical. Where are you in the initial condition of your soil and your farm ecosystem? I will tell you, I have been on thousands of farms. All the farms are degraded, all of them. I think one of the things you have to be sober about, your, your land is degraded. Keep in mind, we walked into a really, really bad movie of thousands and thousands of years of degradation. So when you start this to regenerative agriculture, like Ben talked about, I started my journey because I saw failure. I, if you asked me 15 years ago, Oliver, I'd given up. I, I really did. We were spending billions of dollars. Farmers were going broke. Water was never getting clean. It was depressing. The reality is we were already in such a degraded state. We in the United States accepted the degraded state. We didn't know any different. So when you go into an operation, the first thing I look at is I pull out a shovel. That is my most powerful tool. I walk right to the fence roll where it hasn't been farmed in 50, 70 years, dig a shovel full, and then I go right to the, right to the cropland. And you'll see in the, in the fence row, dark, well aggregated soils, smell. And then you walk to the cropland and it looks 10 shades lighter, degraded, compacted, and I said, this is you. This is the way nature does. Walk right to the fence pole, walk to the, the, uh, the trees where the grass waterway, walk right to the where, the where the trees are at. And you're gonna be very sober on how far you are from the ecosystem. So context, context, context is everything. So that's what, how I approach it, context, context, context. Indeed. And we've heard that from so many of our other speakers over the series of these expert panel calls. It's great to hear it reiterated here again. Now, Adamir, what can you add to this uh, series of observations on these key understandings and points of intervention into annual cropping systems like this? 
So in Brazil, in general, the farmers, there is uh, like a coincidence with the, the awareness about this, the three big uh, general problems in the our annual areas here in Brazil is the soil compaction, the nematode population, and also the root disease. This is the three big challenges that we are in general now. But when we, we look for this, the, the ecosystem uh, very well developed using cover crops, increasing soil organic matter and put a lot of different plants like uh, Ben and also Ray are emphasizing the, the needs of the, the, the promote the biodiversity with different species, different routes, different results, effects on the soil. This is starting to change. I think that is the, the point, for example, for annual crops. Uh, in Brazil, we have a, if you go in general areas or in general uh, evaluation, our, our average of the soybean grain is not so high, but it is around 3, 3.2 tons per hectare. But you have very good farms that I visited just now here in Rio Grande do Sul, yesterday in this morning. So that farm that I using for 20, 30 years work with the biodiversity using different species to take into account the, 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 the nutrients in the soil, looking forward to improve as more as more the biological approach, the, the, the attributes of the, the biological uh, aspects. So this is here achieving five, 5.5 or six tons or more, some of them. So I think that the, like I said at the, the, at the beginning, the, this uh, real diagnostic or diagnosis uh, with the all aspect or all context is very important because you have some areas that the people are doing agriculture more than 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And the people said, oh, it's a lot of chemical nutrients, but the problem is disequilibrium of nutrients. We have many of them that we uh, 200 parts per million of 300 parts per million of potassium and potassium 116, the, the, the power of sanitization. So uh, if you put more, you, you, you cook the roots of the bean or the crops. So the important point is also to check this and improve biodiversity. Which biodiversity? Which species that you can add? Which uh, biological products, biological approach of the, the, the organism that you can increase during this year using many areas of this pesticide? So the biological approach is very important. Many times we have a physical problem and this happened they, in, in animal area, they buy a very good equipment with a, like a chisel, very strong. And you visit some farmers that say, oh, no, I use it just for two years. I'm not using more. This is, this is in the shadow of the, the, the big tree. I said, why this equipment so, so nice? No, no, we are not used because it doesn't work. Okay, you check. They just promote the, the breakdown of soil compacted layer, 20, 30 centimeters, many times in the uh, sand in mainly the, the, the in clay areas. When you go check, the problem is aluminum. So we had a compaction that we are talking now. We have a soil compaction, a, a chemical soil compaction. The high aluminum content avoided the roots goes down. In two, three years more, this chemical goes to a, a physical compaction. It's together the both. So if you need to put lime, you need to correct this excessive acidity in order to have the flux of oxygen, the flux of roots, the water, and more organisms in the system. And this is one, one thing that you are using and you are many farmers doing well. And you have some farmers, some areas, they are the problem with disequilibrium nutrients, this problem with the liming, the problem with the soil compaction, and other is uh, overcome this with the real diagnosis and using the, 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 the appropriate adapted tools for that question, that system, and also in a, in a, in a sustainable way, as less as possible inputs and use the modern nature as our great uh, uh, answer, a great uh, professor for all of us. The equilibrium of the, 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 the forest over the savanna area, where they are equilibrium, like for example, Nematodes, 90-90% of nematodes you learn with Dr. Maria Fink from the, the, the University of the, the Germany, uh, that 99% of the nematodes are good, but the problem that the other one that support these different condition uh, goes to have a problem with the other crops. When you regenerate, you go to the regeneration of the soil, uh, that place, that landscape, 
you regrow with all that organism in equilibrium because you're back and you have good pasture, good annual crops, equilibrated exactly uh, the system for that zone, that condition, climate, agroecological condition as well. Yeah, and it seems like we always come back to this observation of natural systems as a guiding force and the necessity of increasing biodiversity and diversity in these systems. And one of the things that we've often heard from our own farmers and people in our network who are coming from the management of a business system that uses monocultures for the necessity of the efficiency needed to manage their machinery and such, how can we find a balance between the biodiversity necessary for a healthy and resilient system and the efficiency needed to make a profit in these enterprises? And let's face it, a lot of the machinery does not pick and choose among plants in a large field. Back to you, Adam. Yeah, this is, okay. Is for me? Yes. No, can you repeat again, please? <laughs> We're looking for the balance between the, Sorry, the diversity. Sorry, slowly. Well, for the sake so of our sorry. audience, I won't go into Spanish, but the question is about finding the balance between the biodiversity necessary for a resilient ecosystem and the efficiency yeah. necessary to make a profit in these types of businesses. All right, okay. So the, the, the scientists from the Embrapa developed a very nice, it was uh, awarded also in the world, a very nice uh, result. They saw, they check in the savanna area, in an area with the, the, the grasses, with the soybean. In another, with the, 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 the fellow condition, we saw it for many years. It evaluated the, the, the amount of nutrients and they evaluated the, the, the content of the soil organic matter and they evaluated the different microorganisms that was in the soil, some organisms, mainly microorganisms, and saw so they discovered the enzyme is one important point. So this evaluation of the, the, the uh, this biological indicator, soil indi biological indicators, they found some enzyme like beta glycosidase, like uh, mycorrhiza, like sulfatase, acid sulfatase, uh, sulfatase, and also aryl sulfatase, and also the, the. So, in the amount of microorganisms, they found that the more corresponded with the high yields they check, it was not the, the nutrients uh, status but also the enzyme. What is the enzyme? Nay, 9% or more is made by microorganisms. So the point is we needed to increase the soil life. Soil vivo, soil vivo. I guess. So the soil life is very, very, soil alive must be alive in. How is, how is the stage of alignment on the soil? It's how the amount of the microorganisms? But you check this, there is a table, some percentage in that area, but you are in another region of Brazil that you just in that area of Savannah that we are, uh, validate this. What do you do here? We go like uh, Ray said and also Ben, look at your forest, your natural condition and check there. How is the amount of this that bacteria, that, that fungi, that, that it's actinomycet and others? It is very important for us to check and also check the, 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 this beta glucosidase it has enzyme, as one enzyme, very, very important. When the residual goes in the end and goes, to transform in, in, in soil organic matter, go in this way or go to CO2 release. The amount of beta glycosidase is very, very, on the most important point to validate. So we needed to improve our soil life. We need to put life in the soil, many microorganisms and also as well, a, uh, earthworm and other microorganisms, very important. More than, than important, you are checking than the amount of biomass produced because you have a lot of biomass producers, a lot of high CN content. But if you don't have a life, that you don't have microorganisms, great amount, you're not transform this for the way to improve soil organic matter. I think this is the point to see, to check where you are, your farm, and to see uh, this proof, to check with how you can advance, which species, which biodiversity I can promote in that condition to increase that annual crop, you not know, to, to follow the, the, the monocrop, but also the multiple crops. And many, some stage we have 45 days with some cover crops, we have two months, three months, four months, 
We have over soy now, very strong in sorghum in maize and other species. We are integrated with coffee. We are integrated with some uh, perennial crops, some perennial fruits. So this is a very important point to, to, to take into account. Yes, absolutely. And so I'll hand it over now to Ray, if you want to expand on that and talk about this key balance between finding that diversity of species in, a, in an enterprise like this and the efficiency needed to make a profit. Okay, I'm going to start off with something very, very simple. I'm a simple man. And as a simple man, my wife reminds me all the time, Ray, simple. Okay, here's how I look at it. Look, if you know how your body works very simply, your body is self-healing, self-organizing, self-regulating. Soils work the same. If you want to know how the soil works, your body works the same way. So what I do when I try to manage that balance of disturbance and diversity and carbon flow and all this, you, you have to learn how to manage disturbance, chemical, physical, and biological disturbance. Let me give you an example. If you go eat food, like, uh, you know, go eat fast food and you get sick, that's an acute stress. Your body was designed to handle acute stresses. Climatic, chemical, they can handle acute stress. But what it cannot handle is chronic stress. Bad food, poor sleeping, over drinking, smoking, the body will collapse. Your system will get sick. Natural ecosystems are the same. Excessive tillage, excessive chemicals, fungicides, herbicides. Did you just kill once or did you kill two or three or four times? And all that wrapped in the ball of context. Are you in a dry environment? When you're in a dry environment, you can't handle too much disturbance, period. Versus you live in a humid disturbance because it's those natural ecosystems, especially microbes, they're subaquatic creatures and work in water. So the balance is balancing your disturbance. The moment you take the uh, plant out of the soil, you created a biological disturbance. You took energy flow out. So your rotations are part of that disturbance. Worst thing you can do is leave bare ground. That is a disturbance. Understand that you're the flow of energy in that ecosystem and you have to manage chemical, physical, biological disturbance. Always remember this. When you approach nature, approach her first ecologically, then you can use the other approaches. So it's not just, it, that's that beautiful balance. Remember, last word, recently they found radio, radiotrophs in uh, Chernobyl. What is that radiotroph? Fungi that eat plutonium and radioactive material. They found Fungi that can eat radiation. Yes, the soil can handle an occasional herbicide. It can handle an occasional. Look, those are resilient systems. The most redundant ecosystem on the planet is the soil. So, but it cannot handle chronic disturbance. It's a fantastic way of looking at that. Ben, I know like Ray, you're actively farming and applying these principles and ideas on your own land constantly. From your experience, how do you sort of square the circle of seemingly paradoxical concepts of diversity and the efficiency needed for your enterprise to make money? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And, and I can't speak for the rest of the world, but in the UK, yield plateau really since the mid 1990s uh, has become more problematic. And then the moron approach um, is something that's happened since about the mid 90s, where we're just spending more and more and more and more getting the same yields. Um, and the only thing that's happening is our gross margin is going down and down and down. So while I, um, I, I love race simplicity and I, I'm probably even more simplistic than that. And I look at the three free things of farming, which is the sun, rain and carbon dioxide, you take those three free things, I put them through my catalyst, which is soil and I make money. Um, I don't, and everything else is a bolt on. Everything else is taking money from you and giving it to somebody else to, to, to make a profit. So for me as a farmer and a farm advisor, it's trying to get back to the absolute basics. 
It's looking at a healthy ecosystem, a healthy soil will provide more money due to the fact it will convert the sun's energy, the carbon dioxide and the precipitation that falls into more yield, more profit, because the healthier that soil is, the more I will actually produce and therefore the more money I earn. Um, so I don't know how simple you want to get, Ray, but for me, that, that, that's really going right back to basics. And do you know what? It works. It really does work when you start removing the bolt-ons, you know, and, and it's how we get back to that. We can do that with compost. We can do that with management. We can do that with thought, with biomimicry. But I think one of the most important concepts in this whole regenerative system is to look at the things that are provided for us. We're the guardians of the soil. Um, I want to give my farm to my children in a far better way than my father. Unbeknown to him, I will ha hasten to add, I, I'm not one of these people that blames a generation for, for um, chemical farming. It worked and it was great. But I talk also about the fact I believe biology is probably not, for me, a pure science. It's not binary. We're not getting um, on and off and one zeros. What we're having is a small amount of black area, a small amount of white and a huge amount of gray. And it's that huge amount of gray is the reason why our chemicals and physics and everything we've been doing to it is now not uh, working. Because the, the absolute amazing thing about nature and biology is the fact that it isn't repetitive, that there are mutations and these mutations are the things that we're finally realizing why unfortunately most of the things we've tried in the past certainly um in the last hundred years and are, are now becoming really problematic so it, it, it's basically scrolling through literature that i do in the uk from the 1850s up until about the 1920s and relearning i guess if only i could sit down with my great grandfather and his his grandfather and, and actually start, um, you know, relearning what, what is essentially an awful lot of things that, that then became so much more simple to farm. So for me, three free things, the further you get away from those three, three free things, the more expensive it does and generally the more profit I lose. Yeah, that's just essential from a business standpoint. And Kind of continuing along with this biodiversity edition vein, there are a lot of new enterprises that are continually being paired with arable cropping, annual cropping, things like agroforestry, integration with animals, uh, holistic livestock management, even things like uh, cover crops and intercropping systems all kind of fit into this category. And some of them are directly for additional um, profits for the business. Some are simply to boost the ecological function of the land. Uh, ben, maybe can you talk about some of your own experience about the implementation of these and the relevance to the context that you can speak from from England? Okay, uh, that, that's an absolute ginormous um, subject from cover crops to, to agroforestry to, to livestock. Um, Shall I, shall I start with livestock and then and then we can perhaps go around because I, I think in actual fact I could probably talk for two or three hours on, on, on what I'm doing on my own farm, let alone um, anybody else's. But but livestock sure. for me... Well, look, so you can either go through these one by one and talk about how they interact with the annual cropping system, or you could take it as kind of an overview of the potential of integrating this with a, a fully biological farm that includes all of these elements. Yeah, I, I, okay, I appreciate it. So um, for me, um, there is no, no ecosystem on earth where animals and plants do not coexist. And therefore, yet again, we talk about biomimicry, looking at nature, that sort of thing, and, and decide that in actual fact, if I want to make my system work, then the integration of animals is absolutely critical. And the more you then look at it, the more you then appreciate that the diversity of animals becomes more and more critical, which is why I, I, I ended up with the flood that I've ended up with, where I have different grazing heights, different animals, different trampling, different requirements. Uh, and, and I use those in and around the farm um, to graze my cover crops. And I plant cover crops because we grow spring crops and winter crops out here in the UK. And... Without animals, it's 
it's a process that works with animals. It's it's on steroids. It works far faster because, in actual fact, you you the impact of animals managed correctly, whether through mob grazing or, or, or sympathetic grazing of cover crops or herbal lays, and that sort of thing. It bring, brings about huge amount of of um, shall I call it soil growth? You can you can grow soil. Really, I can't remember who quoted it. It may have been Ray um, from years ago, but somebody somebody once told me. If you don't like your soil, grow a new one. It, it, and, 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 and you really can. Um, you only have to go to a fence line that's been 20 years down and, and, and the, the amount of soil that's built along a fence line is, is quite phenomenal. Nobody buries the bottom two strands of wire in, in, in soil when they erect a fence. Yet 20 years time, you have to go along with, a, with, with some machine to try and actually put it out of the soil. So that's how far soil will, will build if left to nature or, or if you copy nature. So we can do that with the integration of livestock, the integration of, of, of cover crops and, and, and that sort of thing. And then, of course, you, um, you, you start looking at uh, vertical farming. Uh, and it's something we're getting quite into in, in, a, in a big way in the UK in, in, in so much as agroforestry, whether that's alley cropping, silvo pasture, and, and the, the, the fact that in actual fact, when I look at most of my standardized crops, I'm only farming a meter above ground and probably half a meter to a meter below ground. So in actual fact, if I want to farm more without buying more land, I would like to go up and further down. So it makes absolute perfect sense that the integration of agroforestry um, and alley cropping is something we're just about to take a project of 50 hectares or, or 100, just over 120 acres on my own farm of alley crops where we're planting fruit and nut trees and biomass trees every 30 meters across across slopes. This will prevent um, soil erosion. This will also provide much higher income. It's only going to take 7% of my land and probably return about 160% of the gross margin that I was getting of growing a, a standardized field crop. So all of a sudden that integration of, of, um, of trees into this, it becomes a really important thing. And then of course, you only have to watch an animal in the rain, in a storm, in the sun. They will, they're, they're, I, I'm, I'm a, a huge fan of believing that animals are incredibly bright, which is why I actually provide them free choice minerals as well. And I can touch on that at another time. But they will always seek shelter. I mean, they're, they're, they really will. So you can imagine by sticking uh, agroforestry into my landscape, I'm also providing animal welfare. Because if it's raining or it's sun and thing, there's shade to be had and there's, there's hedges to huddle up and that sort of thing. And all of a sudden it becomes yet a, another step towards my animal welfare. It provides a huge environmental benefit um, for birds and bees and everything else and the insects and the alleys of, of um, wildflowers beneath the trees, providing huge predation um, focuses on the farm. Um, and I can go on and on and on. But um, I, I, will, I will pass it over. So to me, um, the, the integration of, of two or three of those things, absolutely critical. And the profit, of course, of turning what is a cover crop, improving my soil. And, and, and as a side effect of improving my soil, I have meat to sell. I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a fairly good, that's a fairly useful byproduct. I've got another saleable, saleable asset. It, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, and that really builds on what you were talking about, about focusing on the essential free items in farming, right? You're just making the most of them at many new layers and in different forms than with just a single crop. Now, I'm going to jump to Adamir, who is very well known as an expert on cover crops. And perhaps from that perspective, you can talk about the addition of so many other forms of life and different presences in the soil and how that can be a key a driver of biodiversity, especially underground. Oh, hang on, you're still on mute there. There we go. So the history, the history here in Brazil mainly starts with my guru, is uh, Ray, you know very well, Dr. Rolf Derps, this is around 86 years now in Germany, I was a very good friend for a long time. So I started with 77 with him. We have a very few experience at that time. We use, for example, the looping, the Ross White looping, and repeated in many areas, isolated. We have a lot of problems, and and somewhat nematodes, some 
But when we start to uh, increase more these different species, we bring bla uh, black oat, we bring uh, white oat and put vet, we put hairy vet, common vet, field beef, this is start to change. It was, a, of course, a long time of this. And really, this is to promote biodiversity. It is incredible. For example, for EAPR 61 is one of the variety of the Arm Institute research, is a black oat, is uh, they, uh, our friends, geneticists, is, is, uh, follow around 26 different oats. So each one that oat, there was a difference of the root as a totally different, actinic acid and other more citric acid, so different. For example, lupin, lupin, the, the, the process to, to uh, many of them that of you know this better than me, uh, is to promote the release of phosphorus is the uh, citric acid azurates is promote this. When you go to radish, you go to Cambia vicinica, you go to canola, you is, is another things, another aspect. So the, these cruciferized species, they are not roast uh, mycorrhiza. That one is the microorganism, very fantastic to, to release phosphorus. But this uh, plants, this uh, cruciferized are very efficient for the, the, the ace acid phosphatase in the, your roots. And also this promote uh, release of phosphorus. So it's so magnificent. You go to, for example, millet to pure millet. You go to the 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 the, the, the Penicetro glaucum, you know, the most important, I think, is in the world. We got 24 years ago. We published it. We our friends recycling 386 kilos of kitchen wool potassium is a fantastic. So each plant has, and also the variety. When you change variety, for example, the 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 uh, different varieties of the oat, the, the, the black oats, for example, in general, they are more efficient to decrease that class of nematodes, to decrease the, the, the uh, Pratilengus bacterius. The white oats are more efficient to decrease the uh, knot root nematodes. So the, the, mm -hmm. the variety are different. This is important to put in the system and you need to test, you need to validate as well. So now we are working four, five, six, eight, like you have said in other countries in France and other different uh, countries in the world, Russia and others. More species, more different biodiversity, more microorganisms, uh, organic acids, and also effects of soil organic matter, effects of, this is fantastic. Different roots, different uh, uh, ability. We are promoting this, this underground uh, 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 fantastic uh, results. So now we have also many different species that, for example, uh, finger millet, we are using our over soil in the maize. We learned this in Africa. We learned this in different countries in Asia. We saw this, uh, it's fantastic. You can use by plane, you can use two, three kilos per hectare in, if you harvest the maize in the covers there. So we are using now just over soil, 10, 12, 14 different species of, and varieties of cover crops. I've been working 162 different varieties and species in 51 countries. That was the possibility. Not I don't know this country, but I work with this in line with the Ray Archuleta, Gay Brown, and many other people. So this is a huge amount of uh, uh, teaching by modern nature. It is you can do that, but you need to test according to your special condition. Just a small comment, not this. For example, now in Brazil, no till. No Ray, no this, and also many, many other of you uh, uh, that are here, Mahi Barts, that know very well this. So we have uh, 2072, 2080, 49 years that is starting no till in Brazil, 48 years. We have some farm with 30, 35 years. The problem is they don't want to touch more the soil. Okay, they put line, line in line. You have a five, 10 centimeters, it's very high pH, with a lot of calcium. But when you go zero to 20, you have a plant acidity. So you need to put this calcium into the soil. This is by calcium sulfate, by gypsum. Some of the details that you need to change, and this will be better for microorganisms. You, you change this. So first, you control the erosion. We improve the wall infiltration. You promote uh, more soil aggregate, more soil structure, and this will be better. But now, how is the amount of nutrients? Micronutrients, another point. So we have different this, and you put this in the system, the biodiversity with the, 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 the trees, with the integration. Brazil has more than now, more than 50 million hectares of this. This integration will very well uh, succeed with the farmers. So 
the, the, the lesson is coming. Every day you are learning the system, but you need to open the mind to see this. That is not, it's not uh, stopped, not restricted, it's very open. But the modern nature wants to, to teach us always. It's a huge way to follow and a sustainable way. My goodness, Anime is so easy to see how your way of speaking has inspired so many people to adopt cover crops. It's a very dynamic uh, way of talking about something that people often look over think thinking it's just an additive to prevent damage, but seeing how many opportunities there are to actually improve systems and close the loops on full ecologies and the biodiversity needed for resilience. Now, Ray, you and I were talking just briefly before this about how necessary you think that integrating animals into these systems are. Can you explain how that's such an important intervention to repair ecologies in these annual cropping systems? Yes, there's a, there's a really cool saying that says, the problem with economists, they leave the ecology out. The problem with ecologists, they leave the human out. Then we're stuck in this world of abyss and not really knowing where we're at. Look, I look at diversity this way. Diversity of animals, insects, every little, every creature on this planet serves purpose. They're the software of this planet. Please keep in mind, this planet would be rock, just like Mars. It would be a rock, rock and water. Without the diversity, like, our, like, our, like this phone, it's plastic. Without the software, it's worthless. Your computer, it's worthless, a big piece of plastic without the software. The software of the planet is diversity of organism, of plants, every insect, every plant, every animal. There are many environmental groups that are trying to push, like we gotta get cows out of the system. Well, that's, they don't know what they're talking about because without grazing animals in the system, we cannot restore and turn our deserts back into prairies. We know now through recent archeology, span Saudi Arabia was all once vegetated. They found elephant tusks there. It was once green. This whole planet was covered with savannas, trees, forests, prairies. There was no deserts. How did it stay like that? Life, life of organisms. So what does biodiversity do? It transfers energy, water, nutrients, DNA information. That's what keeps this planet from being dead like a rock. So it's pretty darn simple. Diversity, like Ademir and Ben saying, diversity, diversity, diversity. So when I look for opportunity, I stick diversity into my crop rotation, every opportunity. But it's not just diversity in the crop, it's diversity within space and time. Always think about that because that's what we're talking about. Great book to read is by Dr. Piper, Farming in Nature's Image, page 142. I think it's 142, I'm reminded. They went into a tropical forest, took it down, and they said, we're gonna plant corn and soybean. Well, guess what happened? Nutrient cycle went down, water cycle went down within a couple of years. So they said, hey, what if we go back plant coffee, banana, the architecture of the foods that we eat, but let's mimic the architecture of the tropical forest. Guess what happened? Carbon cycle went up, nutrient cycle went up. It does not have to be the same architecture that, I mean, the same plants from the prairie or forest, the architecture. But Adamir was talking about, we can use those plants to facilitate life. And that's why animals are so critical. The manure, their urine, their hoof, their saliva, they bring life. Final stop statement. We are restoring Alejandro Carrillos and the guys in Mexico, ranchers, are bringing the prairie, the deserts back into prairies. They're restoring the deserts. How? Mimicking the natural system, moving migration, cattle, waking up the seedbed that bring in ecological memory. How? Manure, saliva, the hoofs, the urine, they carry their seed on their hide. We're bringing life back. 
in the biblical proportion. We're seeing that happen. Life, it's done by life. Well, we're about to switch over to our listener questions, and there's a lot to process here. But seeing as we've seen quite a few of farmers in our network and in other places struggle in the initial transition of moving from chemical intensive, fertilizer intensive monocultures into more diverse, dynamic, and resilient systems, there's, there's a trouble in that initial switch, uh, either going all the way or looking at it as a longer term process, what advice would you give to someone who's either had some difficulty starting out or is just considering some of the first steps to start to see results? Um, how can this either be made easier with a bit of advice or where should they start and what expectations should they perhaps uh, moderate in the beginning? Go ahead, Ray. Me, hi. I, um... I think Ray, Ray, Ray touched on this before. Um, most farmers, and we've managed to do it for, for an awful long time now, found a solution in a packet, a jug, a bottle, a piece of machinery. Um, I, I, if you don't own a spade, uh, and more importantly, know how to use it, um, uh, Ian Robertson, who happens to be on this call, uh, listening in, um, is, is something I have huge respect for. That, that, that just some very, very basic, simple things about compaction, for instance, and the difference between compaction and hard soil. Just take a bucket of water with you and um, dig a hole and throw your soil into a bucket of water. And if it pours with lots and lots of bubbles, you have hard soil, possibly dry. What you haven't got is necessarily compaction. If you throw this clod of soil into a bucket and nothing happens at all, there is no air in there at all, you possibly have compaction. So for me, that, that's something that's quite important. It's, it's getting to understand and feel, uh, get a feel for your soil and how soil actually works. It's the, the, the last investment you make is generally in a new drill or a new piece of machinery. And it's for me, um, and, and I can generally only speak for the UK, and I know people have, uh, have done what they call uh, fallen off a cliff edge. I, I, I personally think it's more of a weaning process. You, you, you take the low hanging fruit first. I mean, everybody puts far too much nitrogen on. So, I mean, if you cut your nitrogen rate in the first year by probably 30%, will you notice any yield difference? Absolutely not. And, and I think... Once you start a slight mindset change and you do that first thing and realize you haven't actually ruined everything, it becomes quite addictive. You, you then think, well, what, what, what else can I push? What else can I change? What other little steps can I make? And it, no matter how small each step might be, they all become cumulative. And before you know it, you're actually pushing much more. How, 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 for instance, how can I use cover crops to provide a load of nitrogen? And, and actually, if I introduce the livestock um, that's grazing this, this um, nitrogen fixations of, of cover crops and, and everything else that goes into these cover crops, all of a sudden my, my, um, my potassium and my uh, phosphorus uh, uh, requirements plummet. All of a sudden, your worm population starts starts increasing, and the worm golden ratio of two five seven eleven plays a huge role. All of a sudden, you have mini fertilizer factories, and it becomes this this um, perpetual motion of, of of better, better, better. And and for me, I think that 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 as a farmer, it, it, it's very easy for for a lot of advisors that don't farm to stand there and say you you've got to do this and you should do that. In actual fact. And Ray's doing it himself, and I think and I think there's a lot more kudos when you've said, I've, I've been there, I've done it. I was a chemical farmer. I, I was a chemical mechanical junkie. But in actual fact, these are the steps I made, and they were small steps. But in actual fact, the very first few small steps turn into giant leaps when you really get going. So it, it, it's, that, it's that reduction in inputs. It's do you need... You, you know, the, the, John Kemp talks very much about plant protection products being probably the biggest oxymoron there is. You know, they're not protecting the plants at all. Um, they're, they're, they're doing more the opposite. In actual fact, do we need to put on protectant fungicides? No, because actually what we're doing is stripping any natural defense of that plant. 
So in actual fact, what we end up doing is becoming reliant on that fungicide because once we've removed the natural ability of that plant to resist a pest or disease, unfortunately, within three weeks, we know that that, that fungicide or that pesticide will run out of steam and we've got to apply it again. So it's, it's very much looking at plant health and looking at sap analysis, for instance. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of saps, saps looking at plant health. How much nitrogen is flowing through my plant? Well, in actual fact, when you start looking at saps, <laughs> and we've done an awful lot this year, we've noticed that in actual fact, rarely, if ever, is nitrogen the limiting factor. Rarely. Magnesium, um, calcium, boron, small amounts of things, you know, look at the excesses, manage the excesses, because they're also a problem. So, so there's lots and lots of little things to look at, but just start looking at your soil, start understanding your soil, smell it, dig it, and, 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 and send it away, whether it's a Haney lab or, or, or wherever you are in the world, start looking at your plants. I mean, um, there's plenty of workshops on, on, online about how to interpret sap analysis. And from that, you, that is the natural reduction start. You know, but I think it's a willingness to, to, to uh, uh, the, the biggest thing for me is, it's all very well, everybody stood there saying, I want to do it. There's nothing stopping you. Well said, well said. Adamir, would you like to add to that? What advice would you give to people who are either just starting out looking for ways to start to transition their ecology or who have had trouble in the initial stages of the journey and are looking to get back on track? Careful, you're still on mute, my friend. Like I said many times before, I think the point is where you are. For example, we, we some farmers are starting this, uh, this, this shifting, and this is I said many times here the problem is soil compaction, USA and Brazil. But first of all, of this, which kind, which category that you can say of this soil compaction it is? Is the light soil compaction? Is the medium? What a very strong psychopathic. You can use, for example, pigeon pea, that the root uh, break down compacted layer. So we need to, to find some tools that you can apply at that moment. And I think another point that the general but can add us to this, for example, there are so many paradigms to be overcome. For example, you said here in Brazil, I don't know in other countries, the main soil pH must be around 6.5 for all crops. We have farms just now getting six, six and a half tons of soybean per hectare, NPH 7, 7.2. They said you never can do that. You can. You go in Champagne in France, you see 7.5, 8 or more, 9. Is they have a lot of grapes and champagne and wine. So there are many things that are in the literature that you cannot uh, follow. You can break this as well. For example, basin saturation, they said, oh, 60 or 70 is more than enough for good crops. Our best farmers, tomorrow we visit a farm just here, we are in Cruz Alta, Rio Grande do Sul, is one of the champion of the, the, the soybean. 128 bags per hectare means 7.2, 7.5 tons of soybean per hectare. Many of these farmers, the best saturation, not 6 or 70, it's 80, 90. We have farming 103% of the best saturation. This is like a challenge for this, the science, for many books, many people are promoting this. I think that you need to, uh, to check where you are, what you can do here. Pay attention to the nature, pay attention to the biodiversity. For example, you visit last week, Minas Gerais State, area with the olive production to, to 2,000 meters. We saw that they're using common veg as a cover crops. It's a very acid, very strong aluminum content. It's like this, two, three centimeters. There must be heavy veg. We need to look some cover crops with that aspect that can uh, is exactly uh, fit in that system. So know the soil, pay attention to the modern nature, look for, know about these cover crops or some composting or something that you can go more, more, more fast in this condition. And like uh, Ben said also, really, the disequilibrium of nutrients in many areas for two, three, four decades is the most common. The great majority are disequilibrium here. You said the nutrient disequilibrium, macro and micro nutrients. And also uh, you need to promote this biodiversity. For example, here in Brazil, in some areas, the, 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 the rocks, the powder rocks, powder rocks, powder rocks is 
it's become more common in many people of the regenerate areas. It's good, it's very good, but not in soil uncovered. And, and soil coverage doesn't work. We need good soil organic matter. You need microorganisms, you need to rotate, you need to improve biodiversity. Like Ray said, different species, different tall, different uh, kind of roots and effects on the soil. All of this works, the energy and put microorganisms in the system. So this uh, and, uh, many points that must be considered where you are in, 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 in which place you are. Okay, I am, I am the farmer, I will live on the soil, I have no soil compaction, I have no erosion. Okay, what do you do here? Because many times it's not easy to do all of this. It's a whole system vision is a, a, a cropping and farming system uh, approach. You not isolate, ah, you need to, to kill that worm. We need to use some things, some side. No, we need to promote life, to promote the equilibrium that they are in the, in the forest, in the, the neighbor area. It's fantastic advice for a lot of things, promoting life. Ray, I know that you work with growers and people in transition all the time. Can you add your advice to this? Yes. I love this quote. It kind of spins off what Ben was saying. I love this quote from Don Campbell. So if you want to do small changes, change the way you do things. But if you want to make major changes, change the way you see things. If everything, how you look at the whole framework. I see a lot of farmers give up, Oliver, all the time because they never understood, they never were committed. If you're not committed, do not understand that the soil is alive, you're going to fail, you're going to collapse. That's why I added the soil health principle back in 2016 context. When I work with producers, I always take their, their ecological context. One of the first things, where are they? In the dry area, their human area, context, context, context. I take their social context. Social context is critically important. One of the biggest adversaries of regenerative agriculture is social conditioning of the local community. When a farmer and rancher are starting to go regenerative, the whole community says, why are you doing that? Why are you going to no-till? Why are you doing cover crops? Social pressures are brutal. You need to understand the social, the cultural context. I also take the spiritual context of the individual. When you deal with the Amish, when you take the Mennonites, when I deal with Hawaiian, the land is a spiritual thing. Even from the ancient scriptures, the, it, the land is spiritual. You got to take all those contexts in consideration because you're not dealing with the machine. The problem a lot of times, we as people in science, we, we want to talk to somebody like they're a little computer and it's all data. I, uh, one of the top statisticians in the world said, um, Talib, Dr. Talib, he says, be careful with data. You'll drown on it. I rather teach patterns and principles. Patterns, principles, observation. I can't even get farmers to put covers consistently. Do you know where I start with people's first? Be religious about cover crops. Learn the logistics and do it well. Then we can go to animals. Then we can go to the other things. The problem is we could tell everybody to do all these things, but they don't have the skill set. It is incredibly complex to bring animals into the system. You better know, learn how to do the animals, the cattle, the timing, the logistics, or you'll cut your fingers off. Chainsaws are a very powerful tool, but it's easy to cut off your leg and your arm because you don't know what the heck you're doing. The other thing is we can't even get producers to move the cows one more time. We're talking about minute and they fall apart and they have the problem of overcoming the law to, to study farming and ranching is the complex world you have to be an engineer an agronomist an ecologist a, a cpa forest Really? I mean, it's not for dummies. It is, it is a calm. And sometimes I wonder, 
if I even have potential. So that's the reality of that. Regenerative farming is for. Fantastic and powerful advice from all three of you guys there is very much appreciated. <laughs>